Hello, and welcome to Crafting a Revolution, the podcast. My name is Katie Freeman, and I am your host. Every Wednesday and Friday, I bring you interviews of female and non-binary makers of all kinds from all over the world. Today's guest is Tamar, the CEO and founder of Woodworker Rehab. So this is a little bit of an interesting one for me. Um, Tamar is not actually uh, a woodworker uh, maker. However, she works with woodworkers and makers um, and has created this company with a passion around helping people who are in repetitive work um, basically save themselves from a lot of long-term injury. So really fascinating stuff. And I think you're going to learn a lot from it. I'm going to tell you now, if you follow along on Instagram at crafting a revolution, I'm going to drop um, a link to a couple of the videos that she's produced for some of the stretches to help with uh, stave off long-term Uh, injury from woodworking. I'm going to put those in the link in the bio over on Crafting a Revolution. So make sure that you're following along uh, with the podcast over on Instagram so you can get access to those. All right. Before we hop on into the interview with Tamara, though, I want to give a big shout out and thanks to the patrons over on Patreon. So thank you so much, Lee at Lee Runyon, Annette 513 Woodworks, Katie Thompson, Women of Woodworking, Kevin Lefty's Woodshop, uh, Christy Twisted Twine, Jeremy, Jeremy Spies, Sammy, Go Sammy Lee, Rachel Moody Makes, Bonnie Tool Mom, Bonnie Tool Mom Store.com, Laura Oakley Soap Company, Brandy Studio Obey, Lee the Rainbow Carver, Ellen Little Bear Furniture, and Ethan Ethan Carter Designs. Thank you all so very much for your continued ongoing support helping me to produce two episodes a week every week with no further ado let's hop on into the interview with Tamar okay so um if you're good we can kind of jump into it then and I like to start by asking my guests to introduce themselves so would you do that for me sure I'm Tamar um I am the founder and CEO of Woodworker Rehab, which is the first digital ergonomic injury prevention platform for the woodworking and maker community. Um, I also um, run or am in the process of launching uh, Mend Health, which is the kind of next iteration of Woodworker Rehab. It's actually for people who have chronic pain so you can think about it at the two ends of the spectrum before you have an injury and when it's already become chronic. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, aside from that, I'm originally from Israel. Um, I've been back and forth between the Western Israel and the U.S. pretty much my whole life. And now I currently live in New York. Um, I used to be in the grew up figure skating. Uh, it was my first profession and the first passion of my life. Um, I actually um, am the four-time Israeli national champion. I competed in the international circuit for, uh, I think, maybe nine years. <laughs> um, and I qualified for the Olympics in 2010. Um, and yeah, um, since then, I've done a variety of things. Um, uh, I went to business school. I graduated a year ago. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much the the gist of it. I love chocolate. I love dogs. <laughs> My Instagram Almost. is full of figure skating, chocolate, and dogs. So <laughs> I will say you will you are the first, I think, figure skater, at least who's who's mentioned it, and also the first um Olympian that I've had on. So that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> at least for my sake, anyways. Um how does, I guess, uh, I guess we'll kind of get into that more. So <clears throat> you mentioned, you know, you're, you're um, from Israel, but you kind of grew, grew up a little bit between yeah. the two. Um, what, besides figure skating, I guess, what other things interested you like growing up? 
Was there anything else besides there's, there's, there's nothing else because that's the way because that's the way it works. So and, and the figure skaters, especially uh, in, in single and women field, your um, career is really short. For context, the last Olympic champion was 15, um, and she is retired today. And that was um, she's like 18 years old. Okay. So you have a very short window of time, and primarily it's because. Um, of overuse injuries, which is how I ended up um, in woodworking in the first place, which is a kind of a, a, a another story. But um, I was homeschooled, so I didn't. There was nothing else. Like I would wake up in the morning from the time I was maybe ten. I would go to the rink. Um, I would skate for about four hours with some breaks in the middle. I would do ballet. I would do off-ice training uh, to actually for body enhancement to prevent injury and also to strengthen my body. Mm -hmm. um, I'd go home. I'd study. Um, I'd travel to competitions. I, I got to travel all around the world. Actually, it was an amazing opportunity. Uh, from the time I was like 13, I would travel and represent my country in Germany. Um, I left home when I was uh, 16 because my, my family moved back to Israel, so I moved to, to New Jersey, and I lived with um, an 80-year-old Holocaust survivor, actually, um, and to, to pursue skating because in Israel, there are not many resources, so, um, you know, I, I, there wasn't anything else. There was no time for any other interests, um, and it's a very unique time in your life where you just get to, like, focus on one thing. There's, like, no boys, no prom, <laughs> and I wasn't interested in any of it. Um, and it's a bit of a shock what happened after because my career sort of like stopped pretty suddenly. Um, so the transition is quite difficult because you have to learn who you are outside of the sport. So I did not have many interests back then. Um, <laughs> um, I had wa wanted to play an instrument. I wanted to go skiing, but you know, skiing is like a big no-no. Mm -hmm. uh, for yourself, I want to play an instrument, but that also no time. So I, there were no, there was nothing else to answer your question. Today, there's more uh, you know variety. Um, uh, I have more hobbies today. I picked up a, an interesting recent hobby, um, which is funny because I, I'm not a big drinker, but um, I love making craft cocktails and experimenting with different. Um, ingredients um, and I view it actually as an art form. I love trying to figure out what somebody may like um, and it comes from me not liking alcohol at all for a long period of time. That's like a recent hobby and I just picked up the piano um, as well. Um, but yeah, this is all like new because I <laughs> didn't have an is interest coming up. Is it a bit of like, I don't know, is it like making up for lost time kind of like no, I, trying to jump into everything you can no or? actually like there's a I never I didn't never felt like I missed out on anything mm -hmm. it's not like I first of all it's not like I would see my friends going to prom because I wasn't going to school and all my friends around me were people like me from all over the world mm -hmm. um, I don't think I had a missed childhood I had a different childhood and it's not like I ever felt like I was missing out what I'm actually missing today is the singular focus mm -hmm. Um, I wasn't interested in other things and then, and I was interested in one thing and that's actually very freeing. Hmm. Um, I don't know how to explain it because you just only want one thing. And it's also something about being young, right? Today, it's actually impossible, right? I'm married. Mm -hmm. uh, I have friends that I care about and I want to like nurture those relationships. I didn't really care about that when I was younger. <laughs> um, so I'm not, I'm, I'm selective about what I invest my time in and, and some, I have a little bit of this personality and I think that's probably all um, athletes or even musicians or anyone who has really focused on their craft for a long period of time. Um, I really like to, to be good at what I do or try to. Um, I have a hard time picking up things and just being like okay at them, mm -hmm. um, which is this own challenge because I, I can't just like, oh, I want to play ping pong and I'm okay being really bad and having fun with it. Right. <laughs> really hard for me. <laughs> I, I get, I, I definitely get the singular focus though, because I think that's how, at least, that's how I feel, um, I would, I would say about woodworking, but to me, it's even more so about like, my niche of power carving like I can do other forms of woodworking and I do uh you know maybe for like a commission or something like that but it's not 
it's not something that I want to strive to like get good at like yeah. doing a dovetail joint is not something that I want to get good at I would much rather stay like focused on what I thoroughly enjoy yeah what what is that exactly I've not actually power, heard of power, power carving is using um at least how I do it some people do power carving with like chainsaws I am not a chainsaw power carver um I do it mainly with angle grinders and then different attachments on that and so you're basically shaping a piece of wood by speed sanding, you know, removing a lot of material and it's all coming off as dust or um, what I would say like speed chip carving. If you think of like a chisel or, you know, some type of hand tool, but it's being done with a power tool um, instead. <clears throat> so, That's why you mentioned, or, you know, that you yeah. do a lot of power tools. And yep. <laughs> yeah, okay. <clears throat> Um, so that, but that's like my sole focus. So it's like, I can go away from it for a little bit for like a project, but more and more it's like, I'm only doing those type of projects for like friends or family, like somebody that I really care for. And then that makes up for me personally, like, okay, it's okay that I'm not doing this thing that I really love to do, um, because it's for somebody that I love. So yeah, I, I definitely can understand like I guess the freeing part of the singular focus, like it allows you to get really good at something. Yeah, which is nice. It's not like, but even within that, I didn't enjoy everything that I had to do to be good, right? Yeah. Um, there are certain things that I was just not naturally very good at, or even like, and we'll get into this because this is something that I, I think all woodworkers, artists, and makers should do. I enjoyed skating. I didn't enjoy the two hours of like exercise and ballet and things I had to do afterwards. But if I didn't do those things, I just wouldn't be very as good. Yeah. Um, so you kind of have to like do something sometimes that you don't enjoy in order to be good. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, today I definitely don't have that privilege anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's, I think what's interesting is that I, I grew up with like my passion. So at, at, even at six, I, I did rhythmic gymnastics before. And at six years old, I was like, okay, that's all I want to do. And when I switched to skating at eight, I was like, I was just going to be a figure skater. And um, I, I didn't think about life after. I didn't mm -hmm. know like, oh, 20 seemed very old to me. And that's like, right. <laughs> whatever. Um, and then you had to kind of go backwards and then like figure out what life without that intense passion is or what I would call maybe obsession even. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's actually what most people have their lives. They don't have something like that. And it's been hard to go to switch. Mm -hmm. So, you know, figure skating is for me is not what it was. Like, I don't do it anymore. I don't compete. It's, you know, that was what I like to do. But, and I don't have it, that passion anymore. And I have to kind of live my everyday without it. Mm -hmm. or the different things I like in different pockets. And it's really interesting because I think that most people, if they ever find their passion, um, it comes much later in life. Mm -hmm. I only knew that. And then I had to learn what it was without it. And it's like very, I don't know how to explain it. It's kind of sucked for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but it has, its, uh, you know, pluses and minuses. I would, <clears throat> I would say, though, from just hearing stories of other um professional athletes especially like um olympic athletes it's a very similar story when they get to that point of like retiring from something like done from childhood into yeah. <clears throat> there's like a like a mourning period you know you've lost perhaps your first great love and now you have to yeah move beyond that um it's yeah, like retirement and that stuff Retirement, yeah, I think there are a lot of athletes who've been talk, talking about mental health a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, Bals and Michael Phelps, but even within my own smaller figure skating world, uh, people are opening up about it more and how when you retire, there's no support mm -hmm. um, and you're kind of left with this huge abyss. Um, I had a bit of a different story because I was went directly into college, which is his own set. Mm -hmm. with, I went from never not being in a classroom for 10 years to going to an Ivy League university where things were very, very intense. Um, and I was a bit shell-shocked and I didn't really think about skating for a while. And like 
the reality hit me a lot later. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I had other things going on in my life then, but, um, most people don't even have that structure that helps them move on. I had like an immediate structure to help me move on to my next thing, which was the university. And most athletes don't even have that. And people within the sporting community don't really reach out to you when you're retired because now you're like not no longer interesting. Yeah. Nobody cares about you anymore. Mm-hmm. And I think it's 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 a it's hard. Um, is a little different for me, and because I was set up um, mm-hmm. to move on to the next part of my life, and it was still tough. But most people don't even have that. Mm-hmm. Hey, makers! Today's episode is sponsored in part by toolmomstore.com. At toolmomstore.com, you can find any and all tool-based merchandise for all genders, all sizes. They've got mugs, they've got shirts, all kinds of cool stuff. I have uh, one of the shirts myself that has the uh, hashtag woodworker on it. And I also have a couple of the mugs that define what and who is a tool chick. So super excited with the merchandise that I have. I know that you will be satisfied as well. Um, And also great discount for those of you who listen to the podcast at checkout. If you enter the code maker mom, you will get a 20% discount off any of the merchandise that you buy. So that's just toolmomstore.com. All right, let's head back into the action. So I, I do have to ask, where does, where does woodworking uh, <laughs> intersect in the, into this? Yeah, story? of course. Mm-hmm. So um, I went to, um, I've had a lot of injuries throughout the time I was an athlete. I had five stress fractures all overuse from repetitive strain, um, repetitive movements. We do the same movements thousands of times a day. Um, and so you have a, see a lot of overuse injuries. Mm-hmm. And I've been to physical therapy when I was a skater uh, more than I can count. Like I started when I was 12 <laughs> um, and when, and I had access to great care. Um, and when I retired, the injuries actually did not stop. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've had two surgeries. And in fact, in over the last year, I had shoulder surgery. Um, and I was in business school and the pandemic hit and I was actually in physical therapy for my shoulder. And I realized that virtual physical therapy has a lot of benefits um, broadly because, you know, physical therapy inherently is considered this in-person um, thing. Mm-hmm. But if but most people don't go for many reasons, it's like it's cumbersome, it's annoying to get to, the exercises are boring. And once you do go, like who does the exercises at home? <laughs> and so I, I became interested in, in from that angle. Um, And I looked at some of the stats, something like 100 million people have some kind of musculoskeletal injury, but only 10% of people actually go to physical therapy and most people don't even finish. So I came at it from that angle and I put together a pilot for virtual physical therapy just to test if it works. And there were some good things and some bad things in it. And I kind of, when I tried to find people to to join the pilot through my own personal network, a friend of a friend, her name is Catherine Emile, and she is the owner of the Vermont Woodworking School. Mm-hmm. She reached out to me and she said, hey, Tamar, um, I read your blurb and it really related to me. Um, the blurb was um, talking about overuse and repetitive strain injuries and the importance of prevention. Um, and even if you're already at a place where you're hurt, you, you know, some of the ideas of virtual care and, and education. And she said that it's kind of like at the school, it's kind of like an unsaid thing. The students come in, they don't really know how to take care of their bodies. And like everybody has these aches and pains and nobody talks about it. Mm-hmm. And the teachers actually had to have some thumb uh, surgery from all their years, I think, of whittling. Mm-hmm. Um, and I listened to the story and then I went and talked to maybe like 50 woodworkers and I kept hearing the same thing, which really resonated with me. I do the same movements every time of day and like my hand hurts and my neck hurts and my back hurts. And I was like starting to think, okay, well, how many hours a day do you do this? And there were sometimes like eight hours a day. So I think about myself as an athlete. I only skated about three to four hours a day max. Um, and I was required to do body enhancement work to prevent injuries. Mm-hmm. Here we have woodworkers who, to me, I heard professional athletes because they do the same movements for even more hours per day, but they're not doing anything um, out of the wood shop to help their bodies. A lot of them 
you know, like maybe they'll, they'll do yoga, but actually that's even worse. Because imagine you're using your hands all day and now you're doing yoga where you put pressure on your hands. Mm-hmm. And, and so I started looking into it and, and learned that, um, you know, so yes, okay, you can saw your hand off, that could happen. Um, but that's actually less likely to happen. Um, and the number one reason for missed work days in kind of carpentry and like trade professions is um, like injury and what's called musculoskeletal injuries, which is essentially musculoskeletal just means all the joints, tendons in your body. Um, and they are the number one cause for missed work days and lost income and also um, death because um, if you end up having to get surgery and you don't have good health insurance, a lot of woodworkers kind of work for themselves. Yeah. Um, and I was like, whoa, wait a why isn't, why aren't anybody talking about this? Um, and she, so the school asked me to put together um, a pilot program that was just um, educational. So it's so ergonomic education and injury prevention education along with exercises that the students would do every day. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we, we piloted over the summer and we just tweaked some things and, and we renewed in the fall and we're still working with them. Um, and so I realized it was a thing, but the thing I did not know, and of course the school wanted me to do it and the students were receptive, but to what extent do other woodworkers, luthiers, makers, to what extent did they want this? And, and is this really a problem? Mm-hmm. And this is pretty, like the whole woodworking thing is pretty new. Um, I started looking into it more and around the, this over the summer. Um, and I had a few conversations and so I'm still learning um, about what woodworkers need and want. And for me, it's a learning process. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I also have a Stephanie Zaucha, who is a physical therapist and she designs all the programs. So I'm not a physical therapist by trade. So like mm-hmm. for me to design these programs doesn't make as much sense. Right. Um, so I have a, a partner who designed the curriculum for the school. Um, and we, we um, record everything and deliver it kind of in micro learning doses. Mm-hmm. Um, and so now I'm trying to see to, you know, if woodworkers probably are interested in, in it. Um, and I'm trying to put out some videos to essentially see um, what they like and they don't like because I'm coming at it from a place of learning and service. I right. want to help to figure out what works and, and provide a product that, that's actually true value. Mm-hmm. Um, and while we're starting with schools, um, I'm hoping to actually make a lot of the, the content that we've already made at school available to um, woodworkers broadly and see if other professions outside of woodworking also may find value in it. Yeah, I mean, I imagine so, like you said, just, <clears throat> pardon me, anybody in trades um, probably would highly <laughs> benefit from something uh, similar, you know. Uh, yeah, it's not something, to your point, it's not something that's ever talked about. I mean, I went, you know, I took some woodworking classes and stuff, and it was never talked about, like, this is what's going to happen, like, to your yeah. body <laughs> over time, um, you know, and, and I think maybe because, maybe it's not traditionally, but I, I know, like, a lot of people that make up the woodworking community are like, and probably still today are older men. And they got into it like as a hobby, you know, perhaps before retirement and now they're retired. And this is just like, this is their way to like putz around the garage and like make something and do and have something to fill their days um, after retiring from like their full time work um which is interesting because you would think given their age they're probably more prone for um uh injury than you know somebody who's like 18 going in uh the carpentry school what i think is 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 going on is if you probably the older generation accepts the idea of being in pain it's become normalized Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, of course, my hands hurt. Um, it's part of being a woodworker. It's part of aging. Mm-hmm. Actually, that's not true. That's not normal at all. <laughs> that's actually part of the issue is that um, a lot of pain has been normalized in our society broadly. 
it sucks. So people just kind of, oh yeah, this is what happens. But actually, um, if you, this is outside of woodworking, ergonomics, okay? So we are we are doing this all day long. Yep. Um, our heads are down. We look at their phones. And then the next time I look, my neck hurts. Why does my neck hurt? So, and, and woodworking, let's say you're, um, or in, in any craft, let's say you're marking, right? Before you start going. So you're hunched over probably for hours. Mm -hmm. um, and so then like you, you see, actually, if you, you see an older population, if you ever see that they're, they actually have a little bit of a hunchback. Yep. Um, that occurs from actually hours of this. Eventually your body just stays in that position. Yeah. I think that the younger generation is more, um, it's kind of like climate change. Mm -hmm. With them, the generation or people probably think, oh, that's just like a thing that was happening. We're more aware today. Um, we're more aware of health and wellness probably. People talk about it more. Um, so I do think that, you know, people are more receptive, but it cannot be normalized. Yeah. That's the main issue. Um, I also believe that schools are the right time to start, um, although it's harder because um, it, it has to come from the teachers and sort of the institution. Yeah. Because if you're coming in who's like 20 years old is in great shape right. um, and they're not in pain yet. And to tell them this is what will happen, it's very hard to um, kind of be receptive to because you don't have pain right now. But if it's taught in school and you're from the beginning, you're starting to implement changes to your workstation, um, you're gonna be more aware and you're less likely to have these issues down the line. Mm -hmm. And it sort of should be a required part of your education. Yes. To, you're, you're, you know how to be a good worker, woodworker, but how much better of, an, of a woodworker and employee are you gonna be if you know how to take care of your body? Mm -hmm. And that's gonna be with you for the rest of your life. So. Um, there is kind of an issue though, like to what extent does a younger demographic want this um, and, and who is the right sort of person to start with? And mm -hmm. that's sort of something that I've still been struggling with too. Um, broadly, like schools, you know, they have, they, they to adopt it, right? They have to, um, it has, it has they even, you can't just like, okay, let's do this. You have to have the teachers invested Yep. Um, kind of talk about it and, and, and put, put it in front of the students or else there's going to be a disconnect. Well, you know, it's, um, I guess a couple of things to that. I, in my, my job job, I spend time in manufacturing facilities across the, the state of Iowa. And so I see there where some facilities have, in, you know, implemented uh, like stretch breaks and stuff like that. And, you know, um, and to your point, just like in a school where, you know, it has to be like the institution has to buy into it. It's the same thing, like the organ the organizations have to buy into it, right? So even if a company like gives breaks for stretching, you can see at some companies, it's like widely um, part of the culture because like all of the management comes out and like everybody does it. And so it's much more like, successful than the ones that like we give you time to stretch and like everybody just sits around scrolling on their phone instead of like <laughs> instead of it stretching the whole purpose yeah. yeah yeah and the other point like you bring that up um <laughs> uh because I've been in physical therapy for my tennis elbow and stuff like that um but like even just the next stuff like explaining uh okay when I'm woodworking my neck is like you know, bent over, uh, looking down at my work for however hours, but even in my like day job, I'm bent looking at computers or I'm looking at my phone or whatever device, like no matter what job I'm doing <laughs> is putting me in that same position. Um, and it's starting to have like actual detrimental effects to like my muscular structure, like, like you said, your body just starts to stay that way eventually. <laughs> Here, here's a great visual and maybe this will, this will help. So your, your head weighs about, I don't know, 12 pounds, right? So if I'm sitting straight, you can see like everything is straight now, it weighs 12 pounds. Mm -hmm. and now I'm like this. Now my head actually weighs 30 pounds. And the more I bring it forward to the point where my head right now weighs between 45 and 60 pounds. 
and it's actually very mild. So now um, I'm carrying 12 pounds or I'm carrying 40 pounds. And now all my neck and my chops are doing all that work. Yeah. So the difference in, in posture is like, is, is, is like 40, you know, maybe 30 pound difference. And now you're carrying that. That's a lot of weight. That is. And that actually, <laughs> that actually rigs up too. like, um, so the work I do, the power carving creates a lot of dust. And so I'm always trying to find ways to, you know, protect my lungs and be able to see at the same time without fogging everything up. And, um, and so there's like certain helmets out there that like, uh, people who work on the lathe who are turners usually wear, which it's like, it has a unit up here that's powered and has a fan and it's a full face shield. And it's like, not letting dust in and it's also circulating air for you to breathe. And so when I first started power carving, I wore this whole thing and I had to stop because I was bent like this. And I'm like, the, very addi the additional weight on top of my head, in addition to my head being bent over looking at this, it was like too painful. I had to stop using it. Um, and, you know, and, which sucks because it's like it, I had the benefits for my lungs and everything else. And it made it so much more uh, conducive for work, but I couldn't handle the pain anymore because it was just too much. Somebody needs to design because I've heard this problem of dust a lot already. When I, I am um, one question I like to ask, and I would also love to hear your perspective on it is what is the biggest problem that you face as a woodworker, wood carver? Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I was talking to a carpenter who told me that the dust and like it, it is really bad. Like you want somebody and so the masks um, that are out there, you just can't breathe in them. And so like it's it's it, you can't breathe or they're too heavy, too clunky and uncomfortable. So there's no mask out there that makes it easy to breathe and protects your lungs. He's yeah. like, can you please make a mask like that? And I'm like, <laughs> well, so maybe someone out there is listening. And <laughs> But it's a, it's a problem. But I guess my question to you is, as a, as a woodworker, what, what is, and not just in, in mm -hmm. maybe health and wellness, but even broader than that, what is the biggest like problem that you face? Me personally, it's always the size of the power tools. Like that's created the most, uh, the biggest issues. I mean, that's my ongoing tennis elbow. And I, because I'm in, you know, I've done physical therapy, like, I'm doing the stretches every day, even if I'm not woodworking, I'm doing the stretches just to ensure that I can continue to do something that I love. Um, but that's not to say if I do it for even <clears throat> two or three days in a row, I know I have to like not do it for a week um, because I can't like hold a cup of coffee. Like my hand just won't, won't do it. It will drop it. Um, <clears throat> And, and so that's always been, it's the, it's the size and the vibration, right? And, um, and yeah. so that's always the issue. Yeah. So our world, and we kind of talked about this before we started, but our world is um, made for men. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, there's a New York Times article from like a few years back that talks about temperature and offices. Um, basically how um, women have to walk around the office with like sweaters and all the women are cold because the office temperature is meant for men who are wearing like suits. Our world is designed for men. Mm -hmm. And that, that is probably even more true in woodworking where I don't know what the breakdown percentage, but I mean, I, I assume that it's been traditionally more men. Mm -hmm. So all the tools are made for bigger hands. And so you see like uh, the biggest, um, the most prevalent injury in woodworking is carpal tunnel. A carpal tunnel is actually more prevalent in women broadly. Mm -hmm. And in woodworking, it's even more um, pronounced because all the tools are made for men. But there are certain things you can do, for example, with vibrating uh, the, the tip that we give to the students is to, and, and you have to kind of, think about cost of things too yep. but a really good hack is uh, bike gloves mm -hmm. bike gloves have cushioning and they actually absorb some of the vibration so we recommend that they buy bike gloves but actually we recommend different bike gloves for men and women mm -hmm. because the size of the glove actually matters a lot because of where the cushioning is yep women just have smaller hands yeah uh, 
So it's it's even stuff like that. Uh, and if you start using bike gloves when you're 20, it's much better than when if you've been already doing woodworking for 10 years. So like starting to do it before it hurts. Yep. Just going to like pay off so mm -hmm. much. I don't know what you use, but that's kind of I problem. use I don't use bike gloves, and actually that's a really good point because I struggle to find gloves. <laughs> that's the other thing, struggling to find work gloves that fit um and have to your point padding in the right place. But I use um I wear fingerless, they're, they're, they're made for men, but I do wear fingerless, uh, work gloves, uh, for that reason, which a bike glove would basically be the same thing. Um, yeah. but to your point, I didn't start with it right away. Um, but since I've found the fingerless ones, um, I use them always, and that cuts down a lot on the vibration. Um, it, it extends the amount of time I can work before I start to have problems. Um, I would say I want to circle back to you when you said the world is designed for men. I had on a uh, female on the podcast, a female inventor and engineer, and she's super passionate about getting diversity of both gender and um, ethnicity into the engineering world, because her point really stuck with me. She's like, there is nothing in this world that we interact with you know, nothing that's been man-made that we interact with that was not created by an engineer. And most of those engineers are Amen. white, are white men. <laughs> yeah. Of European descent men. And so if that's who's creating the world, the world is created for them. And actually this happens in, um, today in a lot of AI, mm -hmm. because AI is the training the, the AI is trained on um, data that's inputted, inputted by the engineers. Mm -hmm. And a lot, so a lot of times the algorithms end up being um, biased mm -hmm. because they're trained. It's, it's a, it's just a, they're looking at pictures like them. So they can't recognize, for example, someone who's black yep. or maybe someone who's a woman because all the data has been trained on like things that white men gravitate towards. Yep. <laughs> Um, and the problem just keeps being like exacerbated. Um, there's more diversity than there used to be. I think you have um, Asian, Indian, mm -hmm. uh, but, but women are not really predominant mm -hmm. uh, in the engineering uh, space. It's very yeah. true. Hey, makers. So today's podcast episode is sponsored in part by Alicia Van Osdahl, who is the owner of Basil Blue Design Company. Alicia is a maker of all things, really. Her focus is on beautiful craftsmanship through woodworking, repurposing, refinishing art and sculpture. Her background includes 30 years of graphic design, logos, and branding. If you have an idea or concept that and need a creative solution or graphic design, you can email Alicia directly at Alicia, and that is A-L-I-C-I-A -I -A, at basilblue.com. Or you can visit her website at www.basilblue.com. And fun fact, uh, Alicia actually designed the logo for Crafting a Revolution. So that is an example of the impeccable work you can expect if that is something you are in the market for. So be sure to look up Alicia again at her website, basilblue.com. All right, let's get back into the action. Yeah. So, I mean, when, when she just said that, I mean, it's not like it's, it wasn't a fact I wasn't aware of, but it really kind of finally set in of like, it, it set in with research I've done on, uh, you know, sizing of power tools in particular, where all of it is for men of European descent. Like, that is the sole person uh, that all tools have been tall I'm like five to three yeah <laughs> I, I can't when my brothers are that tall like I they're maybe the world is very differently than I do yeah. Yeah. they see things actually above like the fridge that I cannot see okay yes. <laughs> their world is different than mine yes. yeah so if I'm, I'm if we're all living in a world built for six foot tall men there there's definitely a problem yes Yes. And, and exactly. I mean, and, and you can take it beyond just like gender, right. You can take it to like children. Right. And that's where like you get the movement. Like I have, you know, two kids who have spent time in um, Montessori schools. 
um, which is everything is built to their size, right? So like tables are built to their size. Uh, you know, if the sink in the building is too high, then there's definitely like a stool, a step stool up to it. Like everything is built to their size. And it's like, well, of course that makes sense, right? Like, because that is their world that they live in is like, they're only, they're small. So let's make everything small for them. Um, and so exactly, it's like, that thought just needs to move into pretty much like every avenue of life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, and that's kind of what we're combating, I think a little bit, um, but maybe we'll get there one day. So it sounds like, I mean, it sounds like you've spent time with, you know, a lot of like woodworkers, especially in this collaboration with the school. I'm just curious, like in that space, what are you seeing like as far as diversity are you still seeing a wide range of men um going through the program how do i i don't know how to answer this question because uh, um I'll, I'll just tell you a story so i was invited to uh, be like a fly on the wall and, and just present who i am at the vermont woodworks council mm -hmm. and i was just cracking up because this is there, there are people who are older there not younger and I can talk about the the me talking to schools and what their biggest problem is but this is just like industry not schools yeah. every single person on there was a white male mm -hmm. I have not seen many black people in this field one of my best friends is a woodworker he's he's black he's like seven foot tall black guy he used to be a basketball player and he is uh, studied architecture and he is incredibly talented woodworker I haven't seen anybody else like him I think he is like a very kind of like kind of stand out if he ever goes to like an actual physical mm -hmm. um you know like event with woodworkers yeah. um he's definitely going to stand stand apart that being said um Vermont Woodworking School at least has it's first of all it's owned by a woman and there's um, more women, um, you know, I, I don't know the exact percentage she could tell you more than me, but I've definitely seen in, in some of our sessions, more women there, um, women engaging with us. So like that, that they, they've done really well, but I've had conversations with school who are actually um, really struggling with that. They want to bring in more diversity into the, into the classroom, but they actually don't know how. So when I asked, the question I asked, what is your biggest challenge um, from, from schools and people who run schools, they say bringing in diversity and figuring out how to attract minorities to come into this field. Mm -hmm. um, it's more than just uh, bringing in women. I think you're actually starting to see more women trickling, trickling in. I think it's like diversity, like, you know, uh, Black people aren't really yeah. in woodworking. What about Asians? What about broad, broad diversity of all kinds? Is, is definitely lacking and, and something the schools really struggle with. Um, it's, I, I also don't have a um, very like long time horizon to look at what it was. The only frame of reference I have is see, being in a, in a group meeting um, where you have an older demographic and comparing it to what you're seeing in schools and it's already getting better at least from the male female ratio but there's a long way to go for other kinds of diversity yeah yeah agreed um and i would say too like to your point like it depends on a little bit of where the school is located um like the demographics of that actual area that the school is located in um and i think you hit <laughs> you hit on something I would have a hypothesis that part of the reason that there's more women at the, the Vermont Woodworking School is because it's owned by a woman. That would be my hypothesis uh, because it is around representation to me matters. And so if you have uh, people who own the schools or run the schools or even just teachers in the classroom, if you have more women, if you have, you know, yeah. a, a person of color, uh, indigenous person, like if you have them in your classrooms teaching, then that is the signal that that becomes a safe space. Uh, yeah. The downs yourself, right? Yeah. Not school, aside from being owned by a woman, one of the teachers is a woman too. Yeah. Yep, exactly. 
Um, and the uh, the downside is, is that there's going to be a hurdle by putting, let's say you put a woman of color in as a teacher in a place that's still predominantly white men going through the program, they're going to they're going to have to deal with some discrimination, unfortunately, like they're going to be the one who has to pave the path for the others to come behind them. Unfortunately, that's probably true. I'd love to say that, oh, no, I'm wrong. <laughs> um, but that would mean that I live in a bubble and I don't see what's really truly going on. Um, that's true. So um, I, I don't know. I find it interesting that the schools say that. Because to me, it's such an obvious answer of how to get it is you have to signal the safe space. And I can I could list off probably 20 people of color and different gender identities who are phenomenal in this space. All you have to do is go to social media and you can find them um, and bring them in even as like guest teachers or residents or, you know, not even like full time staff. Um, you could start doing that and signal that this place is someplace, you know, where we want you to be. Maybe it's not obvious to them. I don't know. I don't know <laughs> the answer. Um, I was trying to make a claim to them that by bringing in a wellness, you're actually, um, you're actually just by doing that, you're going to bring in a more diverse clientele already. Mm -hmm. not, not because then you're maybe bringing in somebody who actually cares about that. Yeah. And the younger generation does, first of all, women tend to more so. And you're, because um, carpal tunnel and, and hand injuries are more prevalent in women, partly because of the tools that are made for men, um, you're bringing in an awareness and so you're signaling some kind of differentiation mm -hmm. that younger generation care about and you're gonna reach more people that way. It is yeah. not more, it is not as effective as bringing in a person of color to be a teacher, mm -hmm. um, but it is a start of a shift towards what the younger generation cares about. Agree, I totally agree. Um, just curious, have you been successful with that pitch? <laughs> Not yeah. actually. So to be honest, I uh, one of the reasons I'm starting to, sh to um, shift towards um, woodworkers directly is because for whatever reason, I've actually not been able to get too many more schools involved. So we have one other school, um, and it's been a challenge mostly because what happens is I would get on, I get on many calls. Um, they're all really excited. They want to do something different. They want to, they actually do believe that the students need this, that they themselves instructors need this. But when it comes down to actually implementing it, kind of two things happen. One is COVID. Mm -hmm. Schools are struggling just getting the students to come back, yeah. to wear masks, to get vaccines. They're very overwhelmed with all with all of that. So COVID can be ignored. So that's one. And and two, it's just not as much of a priority for them. They're like, okay, we have so many problems, COVID probably like um, and diversity and getting the students in and getting them jobs. Mm -hmm. It becomes less of a priority for the schools. And they have tight budgets. Yeah. And, and tight staff. So they kind of have to figure out where to allocate it. So I have actually not had as much as I'd want with schools. And I'm kind of going back to the drawing board and trying to see if that's going to be the focus or maybe um, woodworkers directly are willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's there's a there's a difference between excitement and, and payment. Oh, yeah. And that's something that I'm trying to work through. To what extent, um, you know, are, are woodworkers and makers excited about this? versus actually want to pay for it. And we're, we're like really cheap relative to even going to physical therapy. We have a program that allows, so we have two things going on. We have just the ergonomic injury prevention, which is just going to be recorded content that's both like meant to be uh, very short warm ups that you should mm -hmm. be doing throughout the day or even before that you can follow along and education. So like how to set up your work desk, what is carpal tunnel, how to prevent it, um, what do you think about with tools um, and, and what kind of tools should you be getting as a man, as a woman, et cetera? Um, 
that's part one. Part two is we're trying to um, bring an asynchronous physical therapy aspect to people who are already injured. So they can actually just talk to a physical therapist and get tailored programming without actually having to go to physical therapy or pay the high copies and deductibles associated with it. Um, it we're just launching it right now. Mm -hmm. um, like next week, we're going to put out uh, just free content to our subscribers. And I hope to uh, have calls with them to see what they like and don't like. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after a month, we'll see if anybody is actually willing to pay for it. And that will be an indication for me of whether or not this is something that um, I think is going to be big and I want to pursue or not. Yeah. Do you, um, have you reached out at all to or thought about uh, collaborating with maker spaces? And not, no. Um, I don't know that much about them, to be honest. I think. I mean, you know, so maker spaces are generally a space within a community that's going to have a wide variety of tools, so people don't have to buy them themselves and have like a monthly oh. membership, and they come in. Yeah, so it's a workshop, um, and it's not always woodworking focused. You know, they they can have like CNC machines and lasers and. 3D printers and all a whole wide variety. So you're going to get a whole wide variety of people in there. Um, but I would say that that the demographic that goes to a makerspace is probably the exact demographic <laughs> that would be interested in this um, type of programming because it's generally a younger demographic. Um, you know, like college age to maybe mid thirties at the most usually is what's going to be in there. Um, mainly because they can't afford the tools. Uh, so they're going to go someplace that has it. Um, and the bigger cities have like really well established and, you know, maker space. There's one in LA that I've heard about that I reached out to, um, in an email. Mm -hmm. I didn't get a response. Um, but it also requires me to like pick up the phone and try to actually get in touch with them. Um, if so it's the one, if it's the one I'm thinking of, which is owned by a woman, um, it recently changed hands to another woman, and um, in LA, yeah, in LA, um, and she's the brothers actually. I think okay, so. so I'll send you another one then, perhaps um, that it's owned by a woman, and um, I will say like. A little bit of a lag for response because I reached she's going to be a guest on the podcast and um, I reached out and there was a lag so I wouldn't take it as like a no response um, but there's a few others um, like I know a big one in San Diego and um, there's a few even in the Midwest like in Kansas City um, I know like the director there and stuff I bet they would be interested in being available to the yeah. 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 Um, yeah, we should talk about that. I'd love to get some introductions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, because they're the, the members are already used to paying for a subscription. You know what I mean? They're they're paying like a monthly fee uh, right. for access to that space, and so um, it could I, be an addition to it access. Could be in addition to that, Maybe. yes. Yeah. I have thought about partnerships, um, um, you know, broadly just trying to, I've been just focused on schools up until yeah. now. The idea of selling to woodworkers directly actually came from kind of uh, the woodworkers themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I've been invited to present at the Furniture Society. I've been presenting at a Luthier conference uh, next month. Um, they seem interested in it. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know what? Um, here's a sign up. So we, you know, we, I have a sign up on our website and I said, why don't you post in your own um, networks, Facebook groups, et cetera, and I'll see how many people sign up. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a low, actually pretty low sign up. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering maybe, um, you know, people didn't see it. So what I'm missing right now is actually like um, putting something out there to the 40 or so subscribers we have and talking to them to mm -hmm. see how they feel about the content. Um, and just getting it more in front of woodworkers broadly. Um, I'm not like very good on Instagram. <laughs> um, and so getting say, that's, the, that, that's the other, that would be the other key too, is like, it depends on, 
It depends on the woodworkers you've like talked to, to put it out there. Like, I, I mean, I found you through Katie of Women of Woodworking um, <clears throat> and she's excellent at like marketing, right? And so like, if you are aware of her and are a part of her network, then they know about you. Um, but other places are still kind of old guard and aren't, um, just aren't as savvy you know, as far as like really marketing, like they might do a post. And unfortunately, like one post maybe gets seen by, if you're lucky, about 3% of your followers. So you need to like post regularly and about a very specific thing, like super frequently in order (laughs) to actually get a conversion rate. Right. So doing this phase, the Instagram thing isn't, is not going to be my bread and butter no matter what. Um, and so it's really about partnerships um, and getting in front of, of people um, and getting feedback. Because right now I just want to see where I'm adding value to people. Mm-hmm. Um, and if what I'm putting out there actually is helping. Um, and once I know that, I can start doing a little more outreach to, you know, different types of institutions. Mm-hmm. Um, but doing a bunch of Instagram work is not really the path that I want to take. Right. Yep. Uh, well, I'm, I'm watching the time and we are like really close to the end. So, um, I want to give you a chance uh, tomorrow to let people know, like, you know, where, where to find you at, how to find you. Uh, yeah. so they can see all this great stuff you're yeah, I would say like maybe three things. One, if anything that I talked about um, is of interest to you, um, and if you want the ergonomic and injury prevention content, go on our website, woodworkerrehab.com. You'll see a pop-up um, that allows you to sign up for our do-it-yourself uh, programming that we're launching. There's also a section for woodworkers where you can sign up there. Um, so that's for everything related to woodworking. If you're already uh, in a situation where you're dealing with an injury and you don't really want to pay for physical therapy, but you're looking for something lighter touch, we also provide that. And the third thing is um, called men's health. Um, it's for people who actually have persistent pain. So if you've been having um, the same thing for more than a year, maybe a couple of years, um, and you've tried physical therapy and everything and nothing really works. Uh, and you're looking for a real sort of holistic experience, mind body experience to dealing with chronic pain. Um, we're going to be launching um, a pilot program through Men Health that takes that approach, a uh, mind body approach for like the, the physical, the emotional, and the mental aspects of pain. Um, it's going to be a pilot. So it's going to be like super cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, it's signed by psychologists and physical therapists and doctors. Um, that's, uh, you can sign up for that on mendhealth.io, M-E-N-D health.io. Um, so those are the kind of three things and where you can find me if you're a woodworker, just looking to prevent injuries, that's woodworkerrehab.com or even just light physical therapy work. And if you have some, something more persistent, that's mental. health. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was really fun. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. And Katie, where do you live, by the way? I live in Iowa, smack in the middle of the country. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Where in Iowa? I don't know. I've never actually been. I live in the Iowa City area, which is eastern Iowa. Um, So not that far from like Illinois and Chicago. Right. It's kind of in the middle there yeah <laughs> all right so again that was tamara of woodworker rehab and i'm going to include the links on how you can follow along with her and t- check out all of the good great stuff she's putting out there uh really to help all of us makers um keep our be- bodies healthy and functional so that we can keep doing the things that we love for as long as possible so I'll include the links on that Where can you find those links? Well, you can look in the description for today's episode in your podcast app. If you're watching this on YouTube, check out the description down below. Or you can head to freemanfurnishings.com forward slash podcast. And you can find today's episode and all the previous episodes there, along with the links to follow everybody. 
so you can check that out. And like I said at the start of the show, make sure you follow along on fa- or Facebook, on Instagram at Crafting a Revolution. Also super exciting that happened today. I had asked Alma of Pink Soul Studios to um, create a wood printing block for me of the new Crafting a Revolution logo so that I can make my own shirts. So she did that and I got it in the mail today. And so super excited. If you think you would be interested in one of these t-shirts that um, I'm going to be hand uh, printing, then make sure to reach out to me either um, at Crafting Revolution on Instagram or at Freeman Furnishings on Instagram. Just shoot me a quick message. Let me know you want a shirt. Tell me your size, full name, address, and uh, I'll get you hooked up with that once I start getting those printed off. All right. So when I'm not making podcast episodes, you can find me uh, designing, making, power carving, furniture, and home decor over at freemanfurnishings.com and at Freeman Furnishings across pretty much all the social media. I'm active, though, on a daily basis over on Instagram. So come on over at Freeman Furnishings. Say hi. Find me on TikTok and stuff, too. Um, Tell me you found me through the podcast. Always love to hear that. All right. It's the end of the week, and I hope you had a fantastic week. But I, you know what I really hope? I hope you have a fantastic weekend planned ahead of you, whether that means, like, sleeping in bed till noon, which I would die to do, or... um, you know, getting to get out in the garage and make, you haven't been able to make all week because of the day job, whatever makes it a fantastic weekend for you. I hope that's what you get this weekend. And uh, as always, let's go craft a revolution.